Don't you wanna die happy with a smile on your face? Wake up a laughing, <laughs> cause you're free of all the things that would hold you from your ocean view. Life is a landscape. Why don't you paint it your way? Don't you want to live carefree? You usually sing along, Chris. You're not feeling like singing today. I'm not singing it this way. <laughs> Why not? Do you not think it's a great song? I'm not going to do it. <laughs> well, I love it. That's, uh, you just don't, <laughs> well, I'm not going to sing it. You just don't feel like singing. Because I remember, I think it was the second episode, I said, we really should let oh, Dwayne sing that. Sorry, Dwayne. No, but it's actually kind of a nice way to do it. I just wanted to see your response. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, like how, are, are you going to do it with me? I'm out on my s- own. I'm, are you going to sing with me or not? I'm here. I'm, I'm, you know, showing my vulnerability. <laughs> I'm singing alone, you know, yeah. in the corner here. Well, you have a nice voice. Thanks, so, but it, it yeah. you know, would have been... Anyway. Wanted me to harmonize with you. Oh, we'll do it next time. Next time. Yeah. It, is, it is a wonderful song, though. We can agree on that. It is. No, I'll do it with you next time. I just wanted to hear you sing it. Well, I have another song for you. Do you? <laughs> Do you? Money makes the world go round, the world go round, the world go round. Money makes the world go round, makes the world go round. If you could see my face right now, you would <laughs> notice that I'm like doing this half laugh, half eye roll. It's like, <laughs> if this is awkward, when's he gonna, is he gonna do all of it? Well, it's actually not really, things aren't awkward between you and I. No. I think we have a nice dynamic. Yeah. It's a li- it'd be awkward if there was someone else in the room. Yeah, or if I had Liza Minnelli's kind of cabaret garb on or something while I was singing right. it, perhaps. Or if you were singing it to an audience of potential podcast listeners. Ah, oh, damn, I was. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. But no, I don't know that Sometimes song. I forget that it's not just you and I chatting in mm. a room. Yeah, it's kind of nice, though. You know, it's got that, hopefully, that personal feel. We hope mm. you're picking up on it. I hope so, and I hope uh, nobody's offended by my constant break into song no you got a nice voice so Thanks. i'm down for it but no to get into the song i don't know that song that but i imagine you're singing it for a reason yes chris ah, what ah. reason do you think i am singing that particular song well i have for? a feeling that we're going to be talking about money i don't have a feeling i know for a fact that well, we're talking about money yeah because you were in the you were in the chat i was you were there <laughs> i was in the chat you were and, there. And we were talking about money. We were. So for episode four of the How to Die Happy podcast, we had, um, I would say, a, a welcome shift uh, in energetic terms because we, we've, 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 we've meandered, we've, we've danced, we've done a little tango in our first few episodes, haven't we? Um, yeah, and, I'd say so. And our, our last episode and, and, the, and the chin wag attached were, were both pretty heavy. They were full on necessary discussions. Fuck, man. German professor. If you haven't listened to it yet. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Oh, that yeah, I, mean, that oh, I thought that's what you were referencing. No, I was talking now. about the one before. But uh, Oh, oh, about, oh, right. Of yeah, course, yeah. The, yeah, the German professor. Chin, I was talking about the one about Macy. Oh, my, about Macy. My dog stopping, from, you know, stopping me from killing myself. But yeah, that was pretty heavy. The German professor chin wag. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's not been live for that long has it so uh did you enjoy that yeah, <laughs> yeah. fucking hilarious <laughs> well it might be hilarious hearing about it but try being the guy who's almost lost his digit from, yeah as a, re- as a result of a, an amorous expression an amorous expression what a nice way to put it but anyway i didn't mean to pull you off of your thread no there. you're fine you're so fine. you were saying that we were we're lightening it up a little bit well i don't know if lightening it up is the right way to put it we're changing it up a change change of direction which is uh which i think is one of the wonderful things about what this show ought to provide and, and that is um a vast range of of topics to discuss because we're not just when you say life death happiness and everything in between oh wow well, that's a lot right mm-hmm. so that that gives us um that gives us a, a wide opportunity of things to discuss but of course as you and i know and most people listening by now will know it's it's held together by the thread of the 10 common deathbed regrets mm-hmm. um and sovereignty and freedom are, are very much epicentric to this of course which is why we had uh, for the fourth episode uh, a wonderfully um uh witty and um very knowledgeable english chap on the show called chris plow 
And uh, so you're about to hear us talking to Chris about um, not just about cryptocurrency. Uh, and I think that's probably an important thing to point out, isn't it? It, it is a very important to, thing to point out because we we really dug in. Chris really dug in to the philosophy. I mean, we spent a good part of the episode talking about what money is. And Chris had probably as good of a breakdown as I've heard. Yeah, when articulate as well. Very right? articulate. And he took, a, like he says in the episode, a giant step back and started off the, the show by saying, what is money? Mm. And really got us all on the same page about what money is. And then, then we got into the conversation about fiat currency and, and Bitcoin. But yes, to your point, Martin, it is not just about money. It is no. about freedom. It is about a fundamental change to how we look at the energy we put into the world and how that energy is reciprocated yeah. in the form of money. But as you'll, you'll hear in the show, it is about much more than just money. Big time. And I have to say, I, I, uh, I was, I'm super excited after having that conversation with Chris. Because Are you excited because he said that Bitcoin was going to be by 300,000 by the end of the year? Is uh, that what you're excited about? I might be. I'm excited about I that might too. All, I might also be excited that he's predicted uh, $6 million wow. in 2025. Yeah, so. that kind of blew my mind. <sighs> what? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and also excited about the potential. I like, he uses the analogy of a, of a life raft. And he says that as Bitcoiners, as, as people that are ardent Bitcoin advocates or Bitcoin practitioners, I don't know, there's a lot of different words you can mm -hmm, use to mm -hmm. describe uh, what it is that people do as it relates to Bitcoin. But he used the analogy of a, light ra a life raft and saying, we don't want to just float off onto this life raft on our own. Mm -hmm. We want to bring as many people on board yeah. because again, sticking with the life raft analogy, the ship and the ship in this case being the current financial system is sinking. Mm -hmm. and, already hit the iceberg. And already, yeah, right. Exactly. So anyway, I really appreciated that about him because he, he seems like one of those people that is actually altruistic in a way that is rare. There is no doubt uh, in my mind. And I, uh, and that's how I came across Chris and um, he's super uh, altruistic and he's, he's have, he's happened upon, Un this this entire understanding of the monetary system, the, uh, the current uh, economic meltdown, it's been going on for a fair old while, and the evolution of cryptocurrency and and, um, and Bitcoin, and he's taken that knowledge and he's de he's decided. Obviously, he's invested wisely himself, but he's decided to to um, turn his energy and his attention uh, to service to others. So all he's trying to do now is he's written this thing called the the Bitcoin Playbook. Um, there's a link uh, to the web uh, through to his website from our uh, website, how to die happy podcast.com forward slash on the show. And you'll see Chris Plow. Click on that and you'll find uh, a link to his, um, to the, the Bitcoin uh, playbook. But he, all he's interested in doing now is just getting as many people to hear this as possible. And he's not even selling this thing. Mm -hmm. he's, he's giving this information away um, because he just wants as many people as possible to get on the, the life raft. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. So what do you think? We want to just jump in with Chris. I reckon. In the spirit of getting as many people on board as possible. Let's. I think Chris would want us to, to jump just in. Just jump. Just jump. All right. Well, here we go. All this right. is our conversation with Chris Plow. What would, what would you label Chris as? I don't like to label people too much, but just for the sake of people understanding what I he's don't all know. about. I would say he's a Bitcoin advocate. He's a Bitcoin advocate, consultant. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Okay. He's, he's very, very skilled. Uh, the guy knows what he's talking about. And uh, if, you find, if you go and check him out, you'll see that he's, he, he does all the charts and the predictions and you know all the stuff that uh, the majority of us have no clue about. So, so he's a smart dude. That Very he's much taking so. his intelligence and applied it to Bitcoin and understanding it and helping people with no ego whatsoever. You know, a lot of these, and I, all due respect and peace and love to to all of the influencers out there in the world. You know, I, I love the fact that people are sharing all of their know how and yada yada. Um, but he doesn't have any. There's no presentational ego about it. He's not presenting a brand. He's not trying to get 10 million followers so he can make a, a fortune out of, out of being a YouTuber. He just wants people to to get on board with this so that mm. they have some um, some stab at some significant financial freedom. Yeah, absolutely. So, without further ado, without our, further ado, our conversation with Mr. Chris Plow. Chris, 
Chris, did you have a piggy bank as a child? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Um, yes, I did. I think I've, I've still got it to this day, actually. It's at my parents' house. No way. Yeah, what kind of piggy a, bank? It's a big can of uh, baked beans. <laughs> <laughs> did you have a piggy bank? Oh, the Chris. No, I had a coin jar. Oh, so you could, you could always see into it. Uh, like a just a, an old-fashioned jar? Just a giant jar. Oh, you know what I did have? I had a five-gallon jar. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of coins. A five-gallon jar, yeah. But uh, essentially the same thing. Essentially a piggy bank. I used to bank with uh, a bank called the Midland Bank, which was bought by the uh, the banking beer moth HSBC. And um, the Midland Bank, for, for every child opening an account, they would give you a free piggy bank. Hmm. And I had one of them. Yeah, I know. It's a, it's the indoctrination starts <laughs> early, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Come to the bank and get a free piggy bank. Yeah. Anyway. Um, but you don't need a piggy bank with cryptocurrency, do you? Well, on, on your um, when you were setting up that bank account when you were a child, did they tell you that... Um, the value of your savings was going to diminish by 10 to 15% per year. <laughs> <laughs> had they told me, I think I was like age nine or something. So had oh, they yeah. told me, I doubt I would remember. I can't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's a very valid point. So I don't think they did. They're not being very honest, are they? No. And of course there is a question about honesty in banks, isn't there? Well, that that leads me on to to how we might start this conversation, Chris. Because I, I was thinking, we have a mixed audience: um, some who understand a little bit about crypto, some who possibly understand a lot. But I suspect we'll have a, a good um, lump of people listening who have who still have very little idea about what cryptocurrency is. And I wondered to start that conversation: where should we begin? Should we talk about fiat currency before we get into digital we we need to take another giant leap back and talk about what money is because Go. we can only mm. discuss what crypto and bitcoin is uh, from an understanding of what money is well that makes perfect sense i'm ready i'm ready when you are take okay. me back me too all right all right so at the foundational layer what is money and what money truly is, is energy. And in fact, it is the most powerful form of energy that human beings can harness. And the reason for that is that it is the collective store of value and productivity of all of humanity. So that is everything that you've done in your life, but also everything that your parents and grandparents and all of your ancestors every transaction every every service and that they delivered every good that they produced it's all stored in the money and therefore it is as organic as anything in the cosmos when people say that money is evil you know it, that doesn't make sense money is just a form of energy and energy can be used for for good or bad so since the very beginning of time or whenever humans woke up on this planet um we've had to find ways to survive and prosper and at the beginning that would have been you know digging out a cave or making shelter and then we'd start to collect food and then very very quickly you get to the point where you want to start swapping or transacting and you know, at the very beginning, I would have perhaps swapped some cows with you for some of your wheat or whatever it may have been. Of course, I'd, I'd actually like some. <laughs> I'd like some cushions for my cave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. <laughs> or, or some straw. You may, we may not have been yeah. at cushions already, but yeah, of course. Okay. All of these things, right? You survive. It's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, isn't it? First, you want to survive. And then you want to be comfortable. Um, but that's called um, the division of labor. In, you know, at the beginning, where you would try and do everything yourself and you wouldn't get very far. You'd literally survive for as, as long as possible until the end of your life. 
as soon as you realize that you can specialize in creating some sort of good and then swap it with somebody else who's creating a different good, then the quality of your life can start moving forward at a much quicker rate. Um, so at the beginning, we would just be swapping those goods and services. And that's very inefficient because if I'm swapping my cushions for your cattle, well, we have to, you know, make sure that your cattle is ready when my cushions are ready and we need to figure out how much of one is, is equivalent to the worth of the other one. And when we need to start crossing rivers and mountains, etc., becomes really hard. So we quickly tried to find ways to make that more efficient because the more efficient that we can become, the more prosperous we can become. And therefore, we try to use um, certain elements or goods to act as that exchange, that exchange of value. And we tried many, many different uh, things, such as cowrie shells or beads or stones, etc. Many, many, many over thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of years to varying degrees of success. But each, you know, generally across time, we were continuing to improve because that's what human beings do. And that's how, you know, we, we started to build, you know, societies. Well, you know, if we fast forward all the way to the 1800s, which is not too long ago, and at that point, the whole world essentially had landed on using the best money that we had ever discovered up to that point. And that was gold. That's when the world was on a gold standard. And the reason why we ended up on gold is because it is the best money. It has the best functions of money. So that is, it's easily divisible. You can melt it down into coins, bars, etc. It's basically indestructible. So, you know, if you hand it down to your <coughs> children, grandchildren, it's still going to be here in a thousand years. Um, it's fungible. So I know that, you know, my piece of gold is essentially the same as your piece of gold. It has the same properties. But the main reason why we ended up on the gold standard uh, without any decree from a government or authority figure, human beings came up with this on our own, believe it or not, um, <laughs> is because gold is relatively scarce. And that is all of the gold ever discovered, ever mined, can fit into two and a half Olympic sized swimming pools. Yeah, that's a crazy fact, isn't it? I've heard that a few times and I've always thought, really? But then I suppose an Olympic swimming pool is actually quite big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very big. And that all, that gold would be worth $10 trillion. Wowzers. Now, when something is scarce, such as gold, it's very hard to get out the ground. Then it is a good store of value because they can't make loads more of it. So we create... We mine about one and a half percent more gold per year, but that is a very small amount compared to what already exists. Uh, those that know a bit about Bitcoin may be starting to think about stock to flow, which we won't go into detail. But when money has a high, uh, sorry, a low stock to flow, sorry, a high stock to flow, that means the stock is what already exists and the flow is the new supply coming into the market. So gold has a very high stock to flow. When money has a high stock to flow, that means that it's going to be a good store of value. Now, gold, like I said, relatively scarce, one and a half percent more per year. If the price of gold went up a lot, then we could make a bit more of it. We could, because we would put more energy and capital expenditure into creating new mining operations and getting more out of the ground. We could create potentially two or three percent more per year, but it would be limited by what we can find in the earth. Um, <clears throat> so this is, uh, th and this is why gold ended up as the best money. You knew that if you were getting paid in gold for your goods and services, that that gold would be worth roughly the same tomorrow and in a year, and in 10 years, 
et cetera, et cetera. And what that led to was the 1800s was the greatest leap forward in terms of humanity and society. Uh, we had the, the biggest increase in life expectancy, health, uh, art, culture, business. The 18, and the 1800s was the most peaceful century that we've had. There was very, very little warfare. Um, and the reason for that is because whoever the authority figures were, they were um, accountable to the gold standard. They could only spend what they had in their reserves. Otherwise, if you wanted to go to war and you didn't have the gold to pay for it, you would have to ask your citizens to pay taxes. So you would have to justify going to war. And of course, if the citizens believed that the war was just, then they would absolutely pay some taxes for you to go and win that war. But those wars were few and far between, and they were short because you knew if you were going in, you had to have a very, very clear mission. Why are you doing it? Right? You're going to take that land or that resource or kill that king or whatever. So the mission was clear. You went in. Whoever had the best uh, army won. It happened quickly. You took the land, you took the women, and it was over. <laughs> and, uh, and perhaps it's worth at this point just um, discussing who was lending the money to the governments and to the countries to have these wars. That was the people. Because okay. gold is, so what, gold is not a fair, the banks. No, banks, there wasn't really any reason for banks. So banks would just be to hold your gold reserves. So of course, uh, you know, that, that, and that was initially done by goldsmiths, uh, which then turned into banks. So you would, it, all it would be was for protection because you didn't want your gold stolen. So you would keep it in a bank and the bank would give you a deposit. And that deposit would be would be backed by gold. You would have a paper note, and then you could trade those papers. But those papers were the equivalent of gold. Um, fast forward to 1913, and we had the creation creation of the Federal Reserve, which was the central bank in the United States. We'd had other central banks before that, but this was really, you know, the U.S. was becoming one of the most powerful forces in the world. Um, and the Federal Reserve was destined to become one of the most powerful entities in the world. It was a very corrupt process, you know, even related to the Titanic, where some very uh, influential people and billionaires who were opposed to the creation of the Federal Reserve were on the ship, and the ship conveniently sunk. Hit an iceberg. Conveniently. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and they they, um, they they passed it through on a Sunday when there was hardly any Congress people there, and they'd been actually trying to do it for decades. It would be it had been resisted for so long because in those times there were actually politicians that cared, and many of them were forward thinking, and they realised that if this Federal Reserve bill passed, then that would most likely lead to the end of the gold standard and the creation of fiat mm. currency. And um, and it was also a very quiet day in Congress, so I understand, on the mm -hmm. day the it bill was, was passed. Sunday night. <laughs> yeah. I think <laughs> nobody was, four, was working. Four or five people in there. Curious. And so that was 1913. And then, believe it or not, <clears throat> in 1914, we had the beginning of World War One. So... World War I, again, we were told a story about Franz Ferdinand being assassinated and then the whole world went to war because of it, which makes zero sense. And what you actually find is that the central bankers, the Federal Reserve, uh, had been plotting and began to fund both and all sides of the war. And in order to do this, almost in lockstep, most governments around the world most central banks around the world um, left their respective gold standard 
and started printing paper money. So the justification was <clears throat> that we have, we're now at war. It's a world war. It's going to be the worst war ever. We need to protect ourselves. We need to defeat the bad guys. Of course, all sides were saying that. And in order to do so, we need to print all of this money in order to fund it. Because, hey, that's better than asking you for more taxes, right? But of course, it's not better than asking for more taxes. It's worse. Uh, and I think we'll, we should come to that in a second. And so World War I quickly led into World War II, into Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, war on terror, war on viruses, etc. Ongoing warfare, essentially, for the past... War on one, drugs. One, war on drugs, exactly. 108 years. And as we were saying before, war used to be short. I was going to say short and sweet. It certainly wasn't sweet. It was horrific, but short. And now war is supposed to be continuous. And the reason why it's supposed to be continuous is because the mission or the reason for this war is to indebt the world, is for central bankers to print and lend as much paper currency as possible. That paper currency is fiat currency. Fiat means not backed. So since we left the gold standard, we're, we're, the world is on fiat currency. And because it's not backed by anything, whoever is in control of the printer, which used to be paper money, literally on uh, being printed and now it's uh, pressing keys on the keyboard, whoever's in control of that, they, you know, they cannot keep their finger off the button. And because it makes them extremely rich and makes their friends extremely rich, the reason for that is they already own most of the assets and they get first access to all of this free paper money. So they get it and then they buy more assets. The value and am of I, sorry to interrupt. Am I right in saying that uh, around 35% of US dollars currently in circulation have been printed in the last 18 months? Yeah. <clears throat> and I've read 40% of all of the world's money has been printed wow. in the last 18 months. So whichever okay. number, yeah, it's, it's massive. It's still a lot, and it, and it leads to hyperinflation, of course. Well, it's, it's because um, it is exponential. So as soon as you go down this path, then the next time you print money, you have to do more. And then the next time you have to do more. It started with millions, then became billions. Now we're on trillions. And um, when you print this new money, now the value of each unit is far less than it was before. Yeah. So notwithstanding the fact that it's it's no longer backed by anything, um, namely gold, it's, it, it's paper. It's losing its value as a piece of paper. Exactly. Um, because this is the impact of money printing is inflation. In fact, the, the definition of inflation, people believe that it is an increase in the price of goods and services, and it's not. The original definition of inflation is to inflate the money supply. Prices of goods and services go up or down. They don't inflate. What inflates is the money supply. So when you print money, you inflate the money supply. You create inflation. A byproduct of inflation is that the prices of goods and services go up. So for those that hold their, uh, their net worth in cash, which I guess is going all the way back to what you were saying at the beginning about your piggy bank, you know, mm -hmm. for most people, we are taught to save, to save money, to, cr to create a nest egg, to see that number in your bank account going up means you're getting richer, or at least that's what we're told because it's not true. Um, the real, we're told the rate of inflation is one to 2%. The real rate of inflation for the past decade has been 10%. And with all of the money that they're printing now, we're moving past 15%. We'll probably be at 20% soon. So even if you just take the 10% number, 
you know, if you do really, really, really well um, and you save, let's say, a hundred thousand pounds or dollars in your account, well, in one, in only one year, you've lost ten thousand. And the reason for that is the goods and services that you wanted to buy no longer cost a hundred thousand; they cost a hundred and ten thousand. They've increased whilst in value whilst your uh, your currency's decreased. Okay, so just to recap on what you said so far, we we've central banks um, printing money um, as much money as they like. Uh, it's not backed by gold, so essentially it is it's worthless. They don't actually even have to prove that they have it because of course it's not all printed. Some of it's just transferred via digital transfer, and they're lending money to governments on a large scale. Uh, the governments are, of course, indebted uh, and, are, and are ongoing indebted to the central banks. And then the governments uh, have to get their money somehow. So presumably they're increasing and creating more taxes. Is that about the size of it? And that's about, so then the money ultimately goes back to the government through the taxes and then they pay off the interest back to the central banks. Everybody's happy apart from us with our piggy bank uh, with money that's losing value, which was actually worth nothing anyway, and we're paying higher taxes and so on and so forth. Uh, well, I would, just adjust, I would just adjust that a little bit because I think you made a mistake that most people make, which is they try and sort of balance the books for the government. So let me just rephrase what you just said. Well, when we're in a fiat currency system, the government doesn't need to collect as much taxes as they spend because this is why you hear about them continually running larger and larger deficits. All, pretty much all governments around the world spend way more than they bring in. And this is enabled by central banks who lend them money. And everybody knows it's never going to get paid back. The US is $30 trillion in debt. They're not going to start saving soon and start paying it down. <laughs> right? So yeah. this, this is what I mean about the problem becomes exponential. And the, so the governments have no accountability anymore. They can spend as much as they like with no repercussions. Of course, there are repercussions, which we'll come to in one second, but when you're when you're a politician and you're in you're in office for four years or five years and you know essentially that you can spend as much money as you like then what do you do well you, you promise your uh, people or the people all of these free gifts right now it's actually free money literally we'll give you we'll give you loads of free money and in exchange and in exchange, vote for me. And this repeats on a cycle every four to five years. And it's never ending. And what it means is that they just continue running higher and higher deficits. And to fund those deficits, they print more and more money. The only real impact on the people is higher and higher inflation because taxes reach a limit like when it gets to 40 50 percent you can't raise them much more without a revolt and they don't want a revolt so they just want to keep it at that level where people are getting a bit poorer every day but they don't feel like they're ready to go to the palace or what and drag them out by their necks right and and that's where we're at at the moment so they say, hey, we're going to, they even say, hey, we're going to cut taxes for most people. But what they're actually doing to therefore get the money to spend is they're printing it. Now, that's why they call inflation the stealth tax, because when inflation is 15% per year, well, you just need to add that on to whatever you're paying in taxes. It is a tax. And they're going to be, they're going to continue to do that until it's 20%, 25%, 30%, because the stealth tax is much harder for the common person to quantify than the tax that directly leaves their account. And this is why, um, you know, this is why they left the gold standard, because at that point, 
you didn't have to ask for taxes to fund the programs that you are promising in your election campaign. You can just print the money mm. instead. So, and this leads on to um, something we're going to talk about uh, a little later on in this session. But just to be clear, this has been going on for years, right? And am I right in saying this predates the invention and development and rollout of any cryptocurrencies? Yeah, well, no, this is why we started in 1913, because I believe that's, you know, that's the real beginning of this uh, cycle. You know, we're basically coming to the end of a hundred plus year cycle where we went onto fiat currency. We started creating inordinate amounts of debt. That is, as everybody feels or knows deep down, is unsustainable. But we are reaching some sort of end game. We know we're reaching some sort of end game because we just said at the beginning they, they printed 40% of all the currency in circulation. So whenever that's happened before, it has been the end of the monetary system. It's happened in the Weimar Republic. It happened in France in the 1700s. Um, it happened in Argentina and Venezuela more recently. So there is a long history. Every fiat currency that's ever existed has gone to zero. This time is very interesting because now we're essentially talking about the whole world all at once. And therefore, what we can't predict exactly how this end game is going to play out or how long it's going to take. But what we can say for sure is it's showing all the hallmarks of being in the final throws whether that's in the next year five years ten years that's what we remains to be seen okay well you, so you, you've just um inspired me to read a few uh headlines to you uh which i think is in line with where this conversation is going so this is from the 13th of october the british newspaper the guardian bitcoin could trigger financial meltdown warns bank of england deputy and the subline is uh, Sir John Cunliffe. Cunliffe, Cunliffe uh, likens danger to 2008 crash and calls for tough regulation on cryptocurrencies. Second headline, 14th of October, CNBC. Crypto could cause 2008 level meltdown, Bank of England official warns. Next newspaper, the Daily Express. Bank of England warning, Bitcoin and crypto could lead to 2008 level recession. And then October 13th, FNLondon.com, Bank of England warns crypto system could threaten financial stability. Before I uh, allow you to wade in, I then found another um, amusing um, headline from actually Mark, March 2016, uh, that says Bank of England developing cryptocurrency. So the Bank of England are developing the central bank digital currency, the CBDC. And so I understand there are another 80% of the central banks. So this begs the question, why on the one hand are the banks and governments scaremongering about uh, crypto and um, uh, terrifying people, frankly, uh, suggesting there's going to be another meltdown, the same level as 2008, which we know was a, gl a global financial crisis. And on the other hand, 80% of these central banks are in the throes of, of developing their own cryptocurrency. Yeah, I, I love to those headlines from the Bank of England because it's probably the first time that they're being honest. And <laughs> what I mean by that <laughs> yeah, is... I'm interested what, in this. What John from the Bank of England is saying, <clears throat> that Bitcoin will trigger a financial meltdown, is exactly what Bitcoin was designed, designed to, to do. do. <laughs> yeah. So Bitcoin... Uh, was discovered in 2009 after the last financial crisis and it was designed in order to be the antithesis of everything that we just talked about over the last half an hour. So um, and, and in two main ways really. Number one, it's a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized network. So there is no bank or payment intermediary in the middle this is a purely, you know, person to person exchange of value. I can send anybody in the world $10 worth of Bitcoin with the click of a button. It is very, very hard for me to send $10 to 
Venezuela right now. You know, I'm sure you've tried it in the past. Uh, number one, the fees, but number two, your bank asking you what you're doing, like trying to tell you where, where you can and can't spend or send your money. So it's completely peer to peer, which means essentially we don't need a banking system anymore when we move on to the Bitcoin standard. So that is what John is scared about. And he should be because he's going to be out of a job. Um, <laughs> The, the global financial system, I don't know what it's worth, but it is probably multi quadrillions and the vast majority of it uh, becomes completely redundant when we move on to a Bitcoin standard. Um, then number two, we talked about gold. We talked about the properties of gold and um, Bitcoin improves upon gold in a number of ways. Um it's more easily divisible, um, which means it's, you know, far easier to run a global economy on a Bitcoin standard than a gold standard. We wouldn't need those goldsmiths or banks in the middle creating those paper notes. Um, it's far easier to send across borders. So it's hard for me to send a million dollars worth of gold somewhere. You know, I'd have to hire security guards and planes, etc., I can send a million dollars worth of Bitcoin very, very easily. But the most important aspect of this is the reason why I said that gold is relatively scarce. We create one and a half percent more per year. Now, Bitcoin is absolutely scarce. There are only 21 million Bitcoin that will ever exist. It is pre-programmed into the code. It is a fixed supply. And... This is essentially we have solved money because gold was the best money up until now. But the fact that we could create a bit more of it and we didn't know how much was in the ground was a uh, something that could be improved upon. And Bitcoin has solved that. It's in fact the first time that human beings have really solved for scarcity because pretty much everything in this world and everything that we can create is abundant. It just depends upon how much energy and resources we want to put into it. With Bitcoin, we've fixed it, we've solved it. Bitcoin is absolutely scarce. 21 million, full stop, no negotiation. Nobody can change that. Nobody can manipulate it. And what it means is everybody in the world who's on, who owns Bitcoin, is using Bitcoin, knows that supply. And they know however many Bitcoin they hold, they will always own that percentage of the total supply. When you have solved for scarcity like this, then Bitcoin becomes the greatest store of value ever known to man. We're seeing that play out already. The reason why Bitcoin is appreciating at 200% per year is because there will only ever be 21 million that ever exist. So as people wake up to this fact, and there are, it's, we have 2% global adoption at the moment, so there's another 98% of people to realize that Bitcoin is pre-programmed money and it's math. And if there's 21 million and there's 7.5 billion people in the world, then what is going to happen over the coming years is the vast majority of the world's wealth, whether that is cash, stocks, bonds, property, etc., whatever people are holding their wealth, is going to move into Bitcoin. Those that realize early will gain the most. They'll be on the right end of the wealth transfer. Currently, m- most, of, most of us normal people have been on the wrong end of the wealth transfer because as they printed paper money, the value of our cash was being destroyed and the value of their assets was being uh, was appreciating. Now the wealth transfer is happening in the opposite direction because Bitcoin is a fair, transparent, public system and we all have an opportunity as normal people to be early, like I said, 2% adoption. And that means when, as that wealth transfer has taken place, which it has been for the past 12 years, then those that own Bitcoin early are going to be on the right side of that. But a transference of wealth uh, along this 
line is is pretty amazing for most most of us regular people, isn't it? It can be if we take the time to understand what is happening. Um, and most people, unfortunately, don't have the information available to them or they are so busy in their everyday lives that they literally don't feel that they have the time to understand it. So for all of those people, what they're going to continue doing is be on this hamster wheel where they know deep down that the game is rigged against them, but they don't know why. And they feel themselves getting poorer and poorer or working harder and harder and not moving forwards. And what most of those people end up uh, realizing is that they get to retirement age and they're broke or they can afford very little compared to what they thought they could compare uh, uh, afford. Maybe they have saved a quarter of a million pounds and you know that was always their dream and then they essentially have to ration for the next 10 20 years because what they what they believe they could afford on a quarter of a million pounds now costs five million pounds right yeah and of course what so what one of the one of the main well one of the threads of of the how to die happy podcast is is around freedom and of course, what you're talking about here is financial freedom. And I'd go so far as to say it's it's a God given right to have financial freedom for anyone who's who's worked their whole lives or whose parents worked and and passed on their wealth. So, so we're into a, a tricky situation here, aren't we? Where it it seems to me from what you're saying that there is a there is an opportunity for the the whole table to turn around, where. Um, uh, hard-working, honest people have an opportunity suddenly to to be ahead of the game for a, for a change, um, and to to turn that uh, that hard work, that stored energy, into something actually worth a significant amount of money. Yeah, I believe freedom is a God-given right as well, and I like to make the analogy of Bitcoin being a gift from God in order to help us achieve that because we don't know where it came from and it had essentially an immaculate conception. There is no founder or no company that sits in the middle of it and therefore you can compare it to Jesus Christ with that immaculate conception. So there's a lot of parallels for me. Um, I do believe it's a gift from God. I believe that those that choose to accept it will begin that path to of course, financial freedom, yes, but it's much bigger than financial freedom because financial freedom unlocks time freedom, not having to work every hour of every day until you're 60, 65 years old. Um, right now, you know, if, if you're, a, say, in a, in a relationship, you have the husband and the wife essentially working eight until six or seven five days a week for most of their lives until they're 60, 65 years old, just so they can save enough to retire. Um, before all of this happened, you know, before all of this inflation happens, let's say in the 1920s, when we're just coming out of the last hard money system, which was gold, when things were still good, well, you had the usually the man, almost always the man, who was working a, a labor job, maybe it's down the mine or something uh, along those lines, working nine until four. And the woman stayed at home and raised the family. And he would make enough to support the wife and the family and to save money and to buy a house and to go on holiday and have enough to uh, support in his and her retirement age. So you can see how times have changed as we moved onto a fiat currency system. And what Bitcoin promises is a return to a hard sound money system. Um, and, and, and with that comes the freedom of time. With that comes the freedom of being able to spend money or time on the things that you actually want to do and want to enjoy. Spend time with your family rather than having to work uh, every hour of every day 
And of course, Bitcoin allows you to be your own bank, as we discussed before. And it also allows you to sit outside of the political system. So if you do not need to rely on any third party or ent- any intermediary where you can just support yourself and your family, then you achieve political freedom, freedom of movement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this, this is one of the, the many reasons why we were so excited to to talk to you on the podcast because I, I, I think and how you've you phrased that is beautiful because we're not just talking about money we're not talking about an investment uh, class um we're not talking about uh, pounds dollars fiat currency versus cryptocurrency we're talking about a, a complete and utter um evolution uh, evolutionary opportunity for 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 society and 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 of course with this financial freedom it comes this ability to to do all of the things that this podcast is encouraging people to do to take more time spend more time with family to spend more time um with introspection to spend more time uh, and effort with healers to help you overcome the emotional triggers that, that you've grown up with all of these t- all of these years, which unfortunately unfortunately now lead to regular conflicts with your fellow brothers and sisters. So, and, and many 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 more um, opportunities to essentially have a, a better life. And uh, and and as you rightly said at the beginning of this session, money is energy. It's stored energy. And uh, and I think we all need to reframe uh, our our perspective on what energy is and what money therefore is, and how this can um, get us off that uh, uh, hamster wheel. I have a uh, oh sorry. Can I just what say one say? thing on that. Yeah, yeah please. It's please. interesting at the beginning of that you said we're not talking about just money. Well. Um, you know, that kind of, I think what we tend to do in society now, because the money is broken, is we try and downplay the importance of it. There is almost nothing as important as money. And it's funny that you said just money. Well, you know, in the Bible, they talk about just money a lot. And just, of course, has a double meaning. Just means justice. And if you have just money... It is money that is justified and it is money that is moral and virtuous. And of course, that is not the money that we have nowadays, but that is exactly what Bitcoin is. And that's why we say fix the money, fix the world. Because if we manage to fix the money, everything else will take care of itself. The downstream impacts are absolutely enormous. Money is the foundational layer of society, has been since we were swapping our cushions for our cattle and if we manage (laughs) and if we manage to fix that and by the way it is being fixed bitcoin will fix it it is an all-powerful force that is taking over the world so it is happening then you're going to see some incredible changes in the way that society works in the way that we act towards our brothers and sisters as you said and it's going to be quite magical well, that's why I love the way you you, you started this uh, conversation, and and I, I use the word uh, just deliberately because we've we've been led to feel that that money is just a part of uh, our problems, um, and we've also been led to believe that we have very little control over this this asset. And I think, as you've rightly identified, um, it is everything. It's not evil. Money isn't evil. Uh, it, it's energy. It's the expression. It's how people choose to spend it or use it. Of course, could be evil, but the, the same could be said of any other um, direction of, of energy. So I, I think it's a it's a wonderful way that you frame this whole story. At no point have we discussed um, the price of Bitcoin in. Uh, 2010 versus what it's going to be worth um, by the end of the year. Although, incidentally, everybody, Bitcoin's $62,500 at the moment. Um, so for the naysayers, perhaps you ought to uh, go off and do some more research. But um, I love I love the way you're, you're positioning this whole thing. And uh, and I, I should add that um, this, is the, this is the work you do now, isn't it, right? You're consulting people uh, to tell them this story and then to explain to them what how they can get into bitcoin or cryptocurrency yeah, yeah. i was watching a talk from jack dorsey at twitter and he said um find the most important thing in the world and then work on that so 
that is my full focus now is to help as many people onto this life raft as possible the titanic is going down that is the fiat currency system um 98 of people are still on the titanic uh, they're all at various levels of awareness some are still you know on deck drinking gin and tonics listening to the music <laughs> And um, funny, just yesterday I was listening to a podcast with Max Kaiser and he was talking about this analogy. Apparently, I haven't watched it, but apparently there is a, um, a video on YouTube which is a demonstration of the Titanic going down and it lasts two and a half hours. And for the first two and a quarter hours, nobody really knows what's happening in fact most people are just still like i said dancing and drinking their gin and tonics etc it's only the the last 15 minutes or so when the middle starts cracking in half that they realize it's going down well we are right on the precipice of most people realizing that it's going down and still Lots of people are there enjoying the music, enjoying their free money that, that, that's been deposited into their bank accounts, um, enjoying buying all of their products and services, which are not really adding much value, enjoying eating all of their junk food, etc. Um, but more and more of us are realizing that it's going down. 2% of us are now next door on the life raft. And Bitcoiners, the Bitcoin community, is we care so much about humanity and we care so much about the future. We want to leave this place better and we want to create uh, a world for our children and grandchildren. So we're not sailing off on the life raft uh, off to, you know, get rich with our Bitcoin. We're trying to get as many people on here as possible before it's too late because there will be a point where it's too late. As the Titanic goes down, if you haven't jumped off, then it's too late. So we're trying to wake as many people up as possible. Nice. Okay. Well, um, we'll we'll have a. I think we'll just interject with our conversation for a moment, just to uh, to play our regular thought from Ketut. So, uh, what did we ask Ketut this week, Chris? We asked him, what would you say to someone who has had problems with money or is currently having problems with money? And the theme that we gave him, inspired by you, Chris, was uh, money is energy. And here's, here's his response. Thoughts from Ketut. As you said, money is energy. So... They lost the money or they won the money. First of all is feel you. Do you have energy or not? You know. If you want something big and then you have to have the energy, the big energy to have something big. So it's like a mirroring. It's not like the outside giving you something, no. You creating the outside because of your energy. It's like a reflection from you. You are the creator. Like we said at the beginning, we are the creator. So we are creating by our energy. And then the money is just, again, it's just a form from that energy. Without money, we still can be happy. And without money, we still can have a big energy. But the money will come to you like a magnet. Because the same frequency to bring you more energy. Because that's the money only one. It's a lot of things, like um, feeling love and you know, have a good relationship. It's like also sometimes when you fall in love, you not even think about the food because you're already full. So bring that energy to take care of yourself and then take care of your energy first. Profound. Uh, sometimes you have to sort of listen crawl through what uh, what Ketut's saying to to see the the key and he does like to talk about food a lot as well which is which is epic but um interesting what he says so one of the things i picked up from that was that what you what you put in you you can take out it's on, it's the it's that energetic exchange isn't it i think which uh, which reflects exactly what you said chris yeah uh, you know once you start down the bitcoin rabbit hole you want to put the energy into learning as much as possible about 
what Bitcoin is, but also about uh, economics and, and economic history. And then you want to put lots of energy into educating others because you realize that it's going to help them. So you become out of service. So just tell us a little bit about your journey then um, since you began um, uh, talking to people about Bitcoin and, and cracking this story wide open. What, what's your process? How are you going about doing this and, and helping people to, to understand um, what's happening with the monetary system, what Bitcoin is, what cryptocurrency is? Because, of course, there's a lot of um, FUD, isn't there? F-U-D. Um, and I use the expression, the acronym, forgetting what it stands for. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt or death? Doubt. Oh, doubt. Thank you, yeah. Chris. Perfect. So there's a lot of FUD around, um, which I'm sure we can talk about in a moment. But what's the process for you? How do you, how do you, how do you help people get on this ladder? Well, I went down the same path as pretty much everybody else in that you buy Bitcoin initially without knowing what it is because you see the price going up and you believe that you're going to make money. And that is a genius design uh, from Satoshi, the creator of Bitcoin, um, because we call it number go up technology. <laughs> it's quite, it's, 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 it's nice, complex. It's, it's very, I like, I, like, I like it. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, Bitcoin is designed for the number in terms of fiat currency. You talked about, per Bitcoin being $62,500, um, it will essentially go up forever, you know. And the, re the reason for that is there's only 21 million, but there's an infinite amount of potential units of currency, units of dollars. So as adoption increases, uh, price is only an indica in indicator of adoption. So as long as you believe that more and more people are going to realize what we're talking about today, then you're going to see the price go up. But it is quite, or it's very volatile, and that's because Bitcoin is on the front line fighting the current financial and political system. So you see these massive swings, you know, and, and, and you know, it actually works in four-year cycles of which we're in the fourth year of the third, fourth-year cycle right now. And as many will know who are listening to that, that means the price is going up a lot. So when the price goes up, it draws people in. And it plays on that human emotion of greed. And we absolutely need to be played on that emotion because fiat currency has created a, uh, a layer of greed across society. So it draws in so many of those people, including myself originally. And of course, you buy it and the price may go up or down. Who knows in the short term? But as soon as you bought it, you're then emotionally invested and you start to um, learn whether, you know, that's through articles, videos, books, Twitter, etc. And you start down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, as we, as we uh, like to frame it. And, you know, 99% of people who begin down the rabbit hole don't come back because you start to uncover all of this amazing knowledge and you start to connect the dots and you start to realize this is about much more than you putting in a certain amount of money and seeing it go up by a certain percentage. So you begin down that rabbit hole. Yes, almost everybody at a certain point gets distracted with all of these other cryptocurrencies, which is more like going to the casino, which I'm sure we'll talk about. And then, you know, as you continue through your process, you are, again, most people, you're brought back into the uh, reality of what's important and what is important is what Bitcoin is set up to do and the fact that it has for the past 12 years achieved all of its goals and is continuing to achieve all of its goals and what that means is the future is very 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 exciting big time so well, you, you, you mentioned uh, other other coins and it's probably a, a good time just to, what I'm really keen to do throughout this interview is just to, to try and clue people up and, uh, and to help um, people who have only have a little bit of information. Because I, I think just to, just to backpedal a, a moment, what, what's occurred to me um, is that we as a society have stepped back from um, 
the uh, the economic system. We, we actually don't know enough about it, I, I suspect. I mean, obviously, I'm not suggesting that we're all the same, but it feels to me like um, a great sway of us don't really have a full understanding of uh, of economics and fiat currencies and uh, the, the story that we've discussed at the, in, the, in the, f- the first half of this um, of this episode. So we've we've almost, for whatever reason, we've we've given our financial sovereignty away to the authorities. Um, now that's either because we were too uh, complacent or too confused uh, or too trusting, but either way. We gave that away, and it, and what this whole um, evolution of, of cryptocurrency and, and Bitcoin allows us to do is to take our sovereignty back, and not only that, it enables us to remove um, a fat layer of I'm going to say middlemen, um, for want of a, a, a better word, a fat layer of, of of infrastructure that we quite clearly don't need when we can. Pay, lend, borrow, peer to peer, from one person to another via a trusted, decentralized system. That's about right. Is that about right? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, all those people in the middle can also be called rent seekers, and that's just a term which means that they're adding no value to society and just trying to skim as much off the top as possible. And of course, when there is so many people and organisations and governments doing that. It means that for most of us, we become poorer. And you are right. Most people haven't been paying attention to what is happening in the economy, um, in the political systems, and they don't want you paying attention. They, They purposely numb you with reality TV and, you know, fast food and propaganda, et cetera, fear around what, could happen potentially in the future and it's all designed to distract you from you know what is really happening and what's really been happening is your your wealth and the wealth of your children and grandchildren has is being stolen and it's being stolen at a dramatic rate Mm. and you you mentioned distractions of course there there is uh an, an awful lot of negative PR around why Bitcoin's so bad. Um, obviously, we discussed some of the headlines around it, it uh, causing a financial meltdown, but it's also allegedly responsible for climate change um, and uh, funding terrorism and uh, and uh, trafficking and so on and so forth. So, so what would you say to someone who's only seeing and hearing this kind of news and then forming forming an opinion? about cryptocurrency slash Bitcoin based on that? I would ask them if, particularly over the the past two years, without getting into the details, but, you know, you could go back over the past few decades. Do you believe that the governments and media organisations are generally telling you the truth and looking after your best interests or not? And I think for most people they are at least on the journey of realizing that the answer is they are not. And, you know, we, it, it is very unsurprising <clears throat> and absolutely expected that um, the biggest threat to the current financial and political system would be demonized by the system that it is um, disempowering. Hmm. Have you, as a matter of interest, it's uh, it's on record. I'm sure that there's been um, the most profound um, amount of censorship uh, you, with the social media and um, and other big tech firms in the last couple of years. Have you experienced any censorship in the crypto space? Um, yes, yes, and no. I mean, I don't. I haven't really been targeted. Um, yet, but I know there are some, like YouTube have been taking down some Bitcoin and crypto pages. Um, yeah, it, you know, it, it's not as bad as some other areas like health. Uh, they're, gen- they're generally trying to do it through the media headlines as you were talking about before. Um, 
but it wouldn't surprise me if that was coming down the pipe. But they are genuinely scary headlines. If 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 my seventy three year old dad uh, opens a newspaper, bearing in mind he has no real comprehension of what cryptocurrency is, he trusts his government, uh, he trusts um, he trusts his bank, he trusts the banking system, uh, and then he reads a headline, a front page headline that says. Bitcoin's going to bring down the the entire financial system just like it did in 2008. I mean that's that's terrifying stuff, right? Yeah, and it's probably going to get worse. So that's why it's upon it's it's all of our duties in order to educate those around us. Uh they're not going to get the right information from their usual sources. So for you know, for somebody like your grandparents, it's I, I would just be showing them the math, you know. They Ten thousand pounds in their account is losing fifteen percent per year. Ten thousand pounds in Bitcoin is appreciating by two hundred percent per year. That's a simple, simple comparison. Really simple maths. Well, on the on the subject of uh, of of, uh, of helping people uh, awaken one by one, uh, we do actually have uh, an audience question for you. Um, so I'm just going to play that now. Be my guest. Let's talk, my friend. Let's talk, my friend. This is not the end. Hey, so I am totally new to crypto, and actually, I find it all pretty um, scary. I was wondering how you think I should first start diving into this world without getting too overwhelmed thank you rose from london what you got well step one is buy some bitcoin and it can be a very very small amount i wasn't expecting you to say that chris (laughs) (laughs) well so some people don't expect it because they would expect me to say learn about it first Uh, but actually get get a little bit of skin in the game really really helps give you the the energy to start learning about it so just buy, buy a little bit you know whether it's whatever is a little bit for you everyone makes that decision themselves um and then you'll start down the rabbit hole um the best book i can recommend is the bitcoin standard uh by safer dean which is essentially the bible for bitcoiners and it's quite easy to read breaks down economic history as we were talking about before but very very easy to understand so i'd do that and then of course i would um go and download my free course the 2021 bitcoin playbook and do you want to talk about a little bit more about that because i'm i'm more than happy um for our audience members to hear about what you yeah. um what you formulated yeah, look, it's free, so I'm, you know, not trying to make any money off anybody. And I, I put it together at the beginning of the year to help as many people get uh, positioned as early as possible. So at the beginning of this year, what Bitcoin was about twenty thousand dollars, and now we're at sixty-two thousand dollars. Sixty-two. Yeah, yeah. So the course essentially just explained to everybody what was most likely going to happen to adoption and price over the coming year. And so far that has proved to be accurate. We still have a couple of months left where we're expecting even bigger things. But that course will really help you understand what Bitcoin is and why the price is going up. Um, it will help you realize, it will help you understand why I could say a year ago that the price was going to go up um, none of this is guesswork and then um, this is a, a never-ending journey so there'll be a 2022 bitcoin playbook which is not released yet but if you're following me then you, of course you'll get the notifications and that will explain what's going to happen next year and so on and so forth it's about they say you you, you get the bitcoin you get your bitcoin at the price you deserve so um, we're just trying to help as many people realize as quickly as possible so they can get on board as early as possible. Well, that makes perfect sense. So and, and we will make, 
we'll make links to uh, to the Bitcoin Playbook website available uh, from our website, and uh, that'll be uh, easy enough for you guys to find if you just go on howtodiehappypodcast.com forward slash on the show. And um, you can find Chris's profile in there with a link to Chris's website. So the big question that uh, everybody will want to know, of course, Chris, is what's next for Bitcoin? What's going to happen in the next couple of months? And um, you know, when's it going to be worth uh, half a million dollars, please? <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's, um, it's definitely an interesting time. Yeah, um, Bitcoin works in four-year cycles. We had a, a peak in 2013, in 2017, we're expecting one towards the end of this year. Um, you know, what that means is at the end of the four year cycle, the price goes up very quickly. And that's when um, there's a lot of media attention. Lots of people who weren't sure about Bitcoin end up jumping in and the price goes up very, very quickly, which, like I said, is an indicator of adoption. It means more and more people are realizing all of the things that we talked about uh, in this podcast. So um, as far as I see it, we're a couple of months out from that peak and we're at $60,000. I'm expecting the price to go up to around $300,000 by the end of the year. And nice. Of course, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, you know, it seem, that seems crazy to a lot of people, but um, I started teaching when Bitcoin was about $7,000. And I was explaining that we are very quickly going to 50,000 and people thought I was crazy then. And now we're past <laughs> that. Uh. So this is the number go up technology. Um, this will draw the, the next few months will draw a lot of new participants in as it did in 2017 and 2013. The price will go up really quickly. Um, what goes up must come down. It, like I said, it's very volatile. So once we have that peak, we will have about a year of the price going down. We call that the bear market. Um, but then we move into the next cycle. And by 2025, we'll have another peak, etc. So for example, by the peak in 2025, uh, I would expect the price per Bitcoin to be about $6 million dollars. And this is important because everybody feels that they're too late and they're buying at the top and it couldn't be further from the truth. Bitcoin will continue to appreciate forever. It's just about re realizing that as early as possible. Wowzers trousers. Um, yeah, and it, it, <laughs> I suppose when people who, who aren't uh, familiar at all with what we're talking about and obviously they're, they're interested enough to, to listen to an hour and a half long podcast about it, but... Um, and you say, I, I suggest it might be worth $6 million. I, I think it's worth just reminding people again that uh, when you were telling people it was going to be worth $50,000, they all laughed you out of the out of the room. Um, so it, 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 I think it's safe to say that, uh, and I, I've, I've, I've uh, followed quite a few people uh, talking about Bitcoin and it, not, not, to, uh, not to inflate your ego, uh, well, you don't really have one, as we know, but uh, you, I, I've been super impressed with the way you talk about this, the way you advise people about it, um, and your predictions, because um, it seems to me, as you, as you said, very humbly, I might add, you said, and so far, I've been quite accurate. Well, I'd say, I'd say you've been more than that. So I think, um, I think for anybody uh, in a, a situation right now who's, who's going, okay, uh, right, I'm genuinely interested. Obviously, always go and do your own research. Obviously, always go and do your own homework. Don't just believe, Chris. Uh, don't just believe like two people. Um, do your homework and understand um, what's going on with this stuff. Um, but I think as you, as you rightly identify, Chris, people are going to be more interested in learning about Bitcoin once they've got skin in the game. So as a lengthy precy to a simple question, how um, for for people who see a Bitcoin priced at sixty two thousand five hundred dollars and think, well, there's no point in me buying Bitcoin because it's it's too late. It's sixty two thousand five hundred dollars. I can't own one of those. What, what would you say? Yeah, well, just to cover another point that you made, don't trust to verify. That's one of the strap lines of Bitcoin. Always verify the information. 
uh, there'll be, there's a lot of people out there saying a lot of things. So do, do the work, do the research because it's really, really important. Um, price is an indicator of adoption. We have 2% global adoption. 2% adoption is the same as the internet in 1997. So if we that'll were, never, that'll never take off. Exactly. Uh, internet if business. We were, if we were doing this podcast in 1997, of course, we didn't even have the facilities to do so. But We'd be doing it by a carrier pigeon. <laughs> hypothetically, we would have been uh, ruminating on whether the internet is going to get big or, you know, reach global scale like it has today. Some people would have said no. Some people would have said it's a passing trend and we're going to go back to writing letters and reading physical papers and magazines. And some people would have seen uh, the future and would have realized that the internet is an exponential asset. Technology is exponential. And those that realized, they would have put a chunk of their money or all of their money in internet stocks. That would have been the investment. And if they'd have done that, they would be financially free by now and then some. So you have to ask yourself, everybody needs to ask ask themselves, 2% 2% Bitcoin adoption, is that going to follow a similar path to the internet as it has been doing so far? Or do you expect it to plateau, slow down, go to zero, etc.? cetera? De- depending on your level of conviction will depend on what amount of your net worth you feel is appropriate to hold in Bitcoin, the best performing asset of all time, the greatest store of value of all time. If you are fully convicted, that may be 100%, right? None of this is financial advice, but what you're saying if you're putting 100% of your net worth into Bitcoin is that uh, Bitcoin is now your savings. It's your unit of account. It's how you hold your wealth. Like a lot of people hold 100% of their wealth in pounds, dollars, euros, and they think it's safe when it's losing 15% per year. So that would be the equivalent. Now, of course, I'm not expecting uh, most people to have that level of conviction, and that's absolutely fine. So at that point, what you do is you figure out the percentage. Is it 50%? Is it 20%? Is it 1%? But the only thing I would say for sure is that for nobody, it should be 0%. Because Bitcoin is the greatest uh, asymmetric bet of all time. What that means is, yes, of course, there is a tiny chance of it going to zero but there is in my opinion a much larger chance of it going to a million five million ten million because that's what it's been doing for 12 years and that's what it's designed to do Mm. thanks chris and of course it goes without saying anybody who uh who sees what's happening now and in invests um in any way, shape, or form, in in Bitcoin, following uh, what we've discussed, could could well find themselves experiencing um, some significant financial freedom. Well, listen, I could talk to you about this until uh, Christmas two thousand and twenty-five, uh, especially if Bitcoin was worth six million dollars at that point. Um, in fact, we'd fly you over instead of having to do this online, <laughs> and, or perhaps. You know, put you on a, a yacht and you can have a, a lazy cruise over. Um, but uh, we'd certainly love to get you back um, if you'll have us, uh, because uh, this is, is obviously, as you said at the beginning of the conversation, it, it's an organic situation and um, it's going to be a very interesting story to follow as it unfolds. Yeah, 100%. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Chris. Uh, thank we you, Chris. really appreciate it. And uh, we will uh, hopefully speak to you again. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much.